My name is Samuel Juntila, working as a postdoc at the University of Eastern Finland. Uh, also part of the, the UNITE flagship uh, of science. Um, I changed my title a bit. I have some first initial results also from uh, some satellite-based tree mortality mapping uh, we have been recently doing. And I will be jumping a bit from a topic to another in my presentation. Try to follow. Uh, just some recent images from uh, from Finland. Uh, this is uh, from last November. Uh, from an from a protected forest area that has been undergoing the, the largest uh, bark beetle damages I've witnessed in Finland so far. So uh, traditionally in Finland we we haven't had. Um, large-scale tree mortality due to bark beetles or, or other disturbances, some storm events uh, every now and then, but but really now during last summer we have been uh, observing really really increased uh, tree mortality, largely due to Ipsipacrafus, uh, the really hot and dry summer of, of 2021 uh, enabled um, the second generation of, of Ipsipacrafus. We, we usually have had a single generation, but the second generation is becoming more and more common now in, in Finland. And also the, the drought is obviously playing a huge role in, in how, how the spruces are able to uh, defend themselves against, against these uh, uh, bark beetles. But we are really lacking any like good large-scale assessments of how the situation is developing, and I think this is one uh, a huge bottleneck in in our forest surveys that we we know exactly which species and with how much uh, timber and and what kind of trees we have uh, almost everywhere, but we don't really know where trees are dying. Um, just to wanted to kind of give my perspective to the big picture of what we are currently lacking. Uh, what do we need really to improve our understanding of how how forest health uh, is going to develop in a, during climate change and how to better understand how how bark beetles are going to influence uh, forests uh, all over the globe. Um, so first of all, um, we still really lack a good understanding of what are the physiological effects of bark beetles when a bark beetle infests, or numerous of of bark beetles. Whether we're talking about Ipsilocrafus or other species, we still don't really know the very well the processes that occur after the infestation, how the fungi that is carried with the bark beetles play. What kind of role they play in in uh, in declining the the tree and and how how these processes go on and this is also very much related to how we are able to then provide all early warning systems how how early are we able to capture any changes in canopies for example using remote sensing. Uh, when we don't really know what kind of changes are occurring. So this is some like uh, kind of fundamental uh, information and understanding that, that we need to improve. Another thing uh, really is, um, I think, efficient means of, for monitoring tree mortality at large scales. So really getting the big picture where, uh, when and what kind of trees are dying. Uh, and and from, from that information, when we are starting to get uh, really large-scale databases of, of tree mortality events uh, all around the globe, we can, we can start then building actually much more reliable risk modeling, uh, simulations of the future, um, uh, what, what's going to happen, and, and um, 
I'm doubtful that is there a really a future for Norwest brews in 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 Europe. Um, one of the sites that we have been doing our work is um, located in Helsinki, which is very handy because it's close by. Um, so I have been working for University of Helsinki for a long time. I still live in Helsinki, so um, it's very very handy there. We have a uh, about 20 hectare size uh, protected forest area, so there's no no management operations uh, going on. Good site for doing research. Uh, it's a really mature Norway spruce dominated forest area with trees varying from that the younger age classes are around 60 years old and, and the older ones are, are over 100 years old. And we have been working with the city of Helsinki since 2020 uh, doing bark beetle monitoring for, for them and, and doing our research. So we have for, for every summer we have field, field data, uh, we have drone imagery, multispectral, uh, also some hyperspectral data. We have dendrometer measurements of bark beetle infested trees. Uh, also in collaboration with University of Helsinki and, and Teemu Paliakka, we have some uh, intensive feed plots with subflux, uh, water potential, microclimate, uh, soil moisture measurements. Uh, yeah, just kind of again to go back to the, on the bark beetle effects on tree physiology. So it's not, it's not really clear what makes the tree dry, die. Um, so we have like the eating of the phloem, uh, it doesn't really make sense. Like if you simulate uh, the, the destruction of the phloem in a tree, it takes still uh, one or two years for a tree to die. So uh, not likely it's the phloem, eating of the phloem that is causing the tree to die. Um, but we have some some early results that it's rather rather related to the failure of the hydraulic system and some there are some few literature um, that has been looking into these topics and and some of the early signs include depletion of needle water content and and, and reductions in chlorophyll content i just wanted to show you uh, this dendrometer maybe this is familiar to you but what the dendrometer data looks like. So um, here's two trees that uh, are healthy or have not been infested. And you can, you can observe this uh, daily fluctuation in, in the tree, tree stem diameter uh, due to the changes in water content. And, and then you see the, the growth occurring during the summer. So from July till um, mid-September. And the red line here is uh, a temperature. We also get temperature data from from these dendrometers. And then we've observed the trees that have been uh, infested. We can see that there's uh, at some point, first of all, the daily, the diurnal fluctuations disappear from from the measurement signal. Uh, and then, then we can observe these uh, declines in, in stem diameter, um, probably due to the hydraulic failure and, and, and the water carrying cells start to collapse um, within the tree. And sometimes these occur uh, when it's really hot, like in the figure below, you can see that in, in August has been a couple of hot days and uh, this tree has, has um, kind of collapsed um, at that time. Two, two more examples um, of these. And uh, we haven't had time yet to analyze the, the data properly, but it's uh, work in progress. But then uh, it's actually a drone. 
uh, based estimates. Uh, so this this uh, already a published paper uh, a year ago where we looked at how the differences in phenology affect the ability to of multispectral drone based imagery in in capturing tree decline symptoms so uh, in the central park area in, in helsinki we have four different areas uh, each about 20 hectares in size and 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 these these areas have been uh, undergoing uh, bark beetle damages uh, during the last years uh, and, and the city city officials ask for help in, in monitoring how the, how the situation is developing. So we had uh, two data sets of imagery uh, from early spring or early summer, uh, end of May and, and then uh, during mid-September and it's, it's five band uh, imagery MikaSense uh, MX, if I recall right, so we have RGB and red edge and near infrared bands. Uh, then we had a quite a bit of field reference data, so we estimated uh, tree vitality based on crown and stem condition. We had we estimated defoliation, discoloration, the size of the living crown, recent flows, and and bark structural damages. And, and created three classes out of these, uh, healthy, declined, and dead. And the decline class uh, was defined so that um, we, we also had or included trees that had only minor symptoms. And in total we had uh, about 1,000 trees 450 for spring and 544 for the fall data set and, and this is only only Norway spruces. Uh, so we did a tree level analysis, uh, quite traditional uh, remote sensing, uh, calculated a set of different statistical features based on the multispectral imagery and, and segmented trees. We used a, a LiDAR data set that, was also, that is also available for, for the Helsinki area to, to segment the, the grounds and, and used random forest as machine learning algorithm to, to test how, how well we can classify these three different classes and 75% of the data sets were used for training and 25 for validation. Um, just to show you the, the general trend in the spectra. So the healthy trees with the green and we're going from Band, in band numbers from shorter to longer wavelengths, so from blue to near, near infrared. And we can already observe that uh, the healthy and the declined classes uh, didn't have huge uh, differences between them uh, and, and the dead trees obviously separate more clearly from the spectra. Um, the blue, blue and red bands especially showed um, differences um, between the, the healthy and the declined trees. Um, which is pretty good overall accuracies in, in the classification. Um, so we tested these for, for the different timings and also for different areas since the, the forest areas were a, a bit, bit different in age and, and their kind of um, how a tree, how a, how a healthy tree looks like 
in one forest area might be a bit different from, from another area. Uh, so generally, the mice value is uh, something that the reviewers suggested, but it's very close to the kappa value, which is more commonly used. Uh, so we were around um, between 80 and 90 percent overall accuracy for uh, for these different areas. Then, if we look at the classes, then the situation doesn't uh, look so uh, bright or optimal, especially looking at the healthy and uh, well, the declined class, uh, which achieved uh, the poorest results, um, varying uh, between 50 and, and, and 65% on average. So, um, but the dead trees are, can be very easily classified uh, and healthy trees pretty well, but we still still uh, lack in accuracy in, in detecting these uh, minor symptoms in, in the trees. Then we were able to produce maps like this um, for the city officials. So the green ones here are healthy trees, and the yellow ones declined, and, and, and the red are, are dead trees. And also, when we are doing this uh, multi on multiple locations, then uh, we, can, we can follow how the situation develops and how, how much uh, new dead trees are arising. Uh, then we looked a bit at the transferability, so do we really need to have a, always a field reference for each, from each area? Uh, so we tested, tested uh, with the, we had the different forest areas. We used one area for, for training and, uh, and then another area for, for testing. And uh, there's a, quite a lot of variability between the the different different areas, and in in best cases, the the overall accuracies were around 80 percent, so quite similar as uh, using using all the data for for training the models. Um, but again, there's uh, quite a lot of variability, but it seems feasible at least to to have uh, and do this kind of um, um, prediction uh, using uh, using uh, the training data from other areas. So, um, okay, very uh, pretty good overall accuracies were, were achieved, and but uh, still kind of the detection rate of the decline trees kind of uh, hampers the following. So uh, optimally, it would be, would be nice to follow how the tree developed from a healthy to declined and, and then to that tree if we have um, like a tight time series. Um, and the, the normalized ratio of red and, and red edge band seem, seem to be quite important for the for the uh, classification, and and then, like I said, that there was some variation between uh, in in tree age between the study areas. So, so actually, the trees can, the healthy tree or the decline tree can can look quite different depending on the area. But then, uh, some more. Uh, recent and some more, much more interesting uh, stuff uh, from my perspective. So, uh, very recently, um, we have been piloting, testing the tree mortality mapping uh, 
in in south southeast Finland. Um, so this is the border of, with Russia, and uh, we have nine different study areas uh, covering over twenty seven thousand five hundred hectares, and and these were imaged in, in last October and November. Um, also we have some, some ad additional areas with summertime imagery. Uh, so we tasked high resolution satellite images in these areas um, with four bands, RGB and, and near infrared band. That's 50, 50 centimeter spatial resolution uh, and, and the satellites were Skysat from Planet and uh, then Airbus Pleiades, Playa and a huge task was uh, segmenting the dead trees from these images, which was done by visual visual investigation, and there's o over fifteen thousand seven hundred uh, manually segmented dead trees, uh, and what make made this task huge was really the timing. So uh, during this time already some of the trees uh, had fallen their leaves. So it's, it's highly challenging to, to, based on only the satellite image, to, to know that if this is a um, deciduous tree with, without leaves or, or a, a dead tree. So our, um, segmenters had to use other layers like uh, aerial imagery to compare to actually see if it, we are looking at dead trees or deciduous trees. Um, and, it, and again it's mainly mainly Norway spruce that has been has been dying so so um, in that sense it's a um, feasible approach. Uh, and then uh, so we tested some deep learning algorithms. It's not my expertise. Uh, have another expert um, who who is who has been doing doing this, but uh, it's it's a unit based deep learning framework, and it seems to be working really well. So this is just like some first initial results, and I I don't have proper uh, test and validation data sets yet, but um, a bit depending on, on the timing of the imagery, we are we are achieving around 90 between 90 and 96 percent uh, detection rates for for the dead trees. Uh, the false flags are mainly obviously coming for, from these leaf of of trees, so summertime imagery would of course, um, get uh, rid of this problem, um, but the performance has been really surprising for me. Uh, the classifier is, is able to even detect uh, loads of the aspens that have different crown structure than, than the dead, dead spruces, and, and they have been able to, to leave them out from the, from the detection. So, and this is one of the most severely uh, damaged areas. So all these dead red areas are are, are dead spruces um, in in Uusima area in, in southern Finland. Just to show you some uh, examples, uh, how and all this is automatic. Uh, it's it's like it's a huge game changer. This for me, like as a remote sensor, you're used to having multiple processes, multiple phases before you you can get uh, any kind of results. And and now we are we are really um, really efficiently actually observing uh, some useful information out of these images and. And as you can see, it's, it's not the clearest image you can you can have. It's not like aerial image. Um, and then, if like a false com color uh, composite, you can um, 
better observe uh, how these uh, um, kind of green blue um, batteries uh, show in, in the image and, and even if there are shadows the, the classifier is able to as long as it's trained to deal with shadows as well uh, it can it can manage to uh, at least partially see through those it's a close up of another another place uh, so you can so you can see it's it's not always uh, very clear and it can be quite challenging to to say which are, which are the trees and which are uh, leaf of uh, deciduous trees another another image and an example from for my summertime image and um, and this this is a uh, like a test image so so the so the, uh, the algorithm hasn't hasn't seen seen this image and it seems to be uh, working really well there's be some misses from um, there's like a rocky um, rocky area with with some shadows that kind of resembles uh, the dead trees uh, so there there are some um, misclassified areas but but mainly it, it seems to be performing very well another another test image uh, here as well and it's obviously it's it's a much easier task for the for the classifier when you don't have those uh, fall time imagery and, and the deciduous trees uh, have still leaves on there seems to be some miss, misses but but largely it's, it looks looks very well really well um, so I think we're like kind of approaching now some first efficient means of, of actually providing up-to-date tree mortality data at large scales and, and the data costs are not so huge anymore that that we can actually provide tree level mortality tree mortality data with reasonable cost and I'm, I'm have been really really surprised by the performance that this uh, deep learning framework is, is able to to provide even despite the uneven imagery quality and we have uh, images coming from different satellites and, and the different sun angles and, and so forth so uh, it's it's still it's very very promising uh, the model tuning is still in, in progress so um, and, and of course the testing and then transferring to other forest types so now uh, we have been only only working in Finland but very very uh, collaborations would be very welcome to test these in, in different countries in here in Slovakia or, or in Sweden or anywhere um, and this actually this has been possible due to this have to advertise we have a, like a spin-off company coco forest which is uh, like science oriented forest analytics company and we are focusing on forest forest health and, and risk management uh, such as large large scale tree mortality mapping and, and we are ready ready for collaborations and providing these tree mortality mapping services so please be in touch if if you are interested uh, in these kind of topics
Thank you. That's all.